Uh, very pleased to have my next guest here with us, Dr. Amar Gupta, uh, the esteemed professor at MIT, um, who has spent his career in trying to solve the most difficult question in technology, which is what comes after innovation, and that is deployment, and why we so often fail. Um, you have, uh, Dr. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your time today. Delighted to be here. Um, you've spoken often of the, that there's no shortage of innovative technology uh, being developed around the world, but we fail so often uh, at the corporate level, at the university level. Uh, we fail so often in deploying that technology. Why do you think that is? I think there's several factors. One is that the people who develop the technology they have the skills in terms of the innovation, they have the terms in terms of the research. We see it all the way, all the time in biology and chemical engineering and all. But they are not the kinds of people who generally have either the interest or the skills to go ahead and talk to people who play the role in terms of applying it. These could be policy makers, these could be government officials, these could be private industry, it could be even the patients, for example. And that's where you have to work with other people and that's where it's very difficult for people in different fields to work together. In the case of telemedicine, for example, the biggest weakness I see is the ability of people with medical skills, business skills, engineering skills, legal skills, policy skills to work together. And as a fact, I should tell you that the most advanced states in, Ari in the US today in terms of telemedicine are Alaska, Arizona, and Hawaii. And the, and the only reason is that there was one university at each of these places where people in all these different skills were willing to work together to make it advance on it. Fewer silos to try to integrate. And on the other hand, if you take the Eastern Coast, for example, we have universities here in Boston, area and others, but they do not want to play this role of different people working together. And as an example, I should tell you that when my own paper in terms of the constitutionality was uh, taken up by the Department of Veterans Affairs and applied, one of my own colleagues walks up to me and said, why did, Amar, why did you waste your time writing this paper? A lawyer could have done it in less than half a day. So that's the way we try to undermine other skills and that's what makes it very difficult to apply any of these ideas. Now, you're famous for teaching uh, perhaps the most popular course at MIT right now, uh, telemedicine, telehealth, uh, for enhancing global health. Uh, uh, for our viewers, uh, MIT students rate all their classes on a scale of one to seven, and Dr. Gupta's class rates a median score of seven, uh, which is an astonishing score. Uh, what do you find um, that your students are most interested in when they're taking your course? Well, I think the unusual thing about the course, in my view, is the fact that I, I take classes which represent the real world. I don't try to bifurcate them. So in my class, for example, we have people all the way from freshman year, not e even in computer science or medicine, they'll be totally different areas like say anthropology or women's studies and all. And then we're practicing doctors. We, so we are one of the very unusual courses which takes people from all disciplines at all levels and puts them in a class together. And the deliverable is not a test or an exam. The deliverable is to change the world in some way. So you can write a paper of publishable quality. You can be involved in a startup. You can be in something else. We want them to do real work on it. And we try to take guest speakers from different places. And I'm very honored that we have people who have come from far, uh, even foreign countries to come and speak in the course. We want them to interact with them, come up with problems, work on those problems, actually make a change. And I really feel privileged that some of the, the students from my class, they've done wonderful work. One of them has started a tele-dentistry company and he claims this is routine, is outperforms the best dentist in the world. Another lady who took my class, she has come up with a bra which is fully washable and all, and a woman can wear it to work, and all her measurements for lungs and heart will be taken while she's at work. So those are the kind of innovations we try to do. So my guideline is to see things which will really work in life, and that's why I feel very privileged and honored that the students have done so ex well with it. That's wonderful. Now, throughout your career, you've advised companies such as IBM, uh, Citi, Chevron. Uh, what companies today do you do you think are are really at the forefront of of translating innovation to deployment? Well, I assume that you're asking this question in the context of healthcare. Yes. And I actually find that companies are very deficient in this area. If I may take the liberty of saying that. Yeah. I remember years ago, I was working on the area of personal computers, and uh, I remember going to a very famous company, and they said, we are in the real computer business, we are not in the toy computer business, we want to deal with toy computers, go to apples and oranges, and Apple had come out at that time. Maybe I should have taken their advice at that point. Then I went around different companies, they were all very nice to me, they were all very uh, happy, 
But two companies gave me a hard time trying to talk with me. One was Xerox and one was AT&T, and they essentially made no inroads into personal computers at that time. Today, the irony is when I talk to executives at different companies, I do not find the vision at any of them. It is really unfortunate. So my contention is that we are going to have a situation where somebody else is going to come in from the back, like Facebook, and suddenly become the dominant player based on the way the, the corporate structures that I'm seeing right now. They all talk about very fragmented views. They can't think about it cross-disciplinary way. They can't think about it, how to really affect it. It's a very localized and very short-sighted view that these companies are taking. And the, the costs involved um, are, are extraordinary. There's a famous statistic that uh, the VA spends a billion dollars reimbursing uh, transport costs incur incurred by veterans. It's, just an to, it's an astonishing number. Just to the hospitals at back. Yeah. That's all what they're spending on that kind of money. I mean, so and, and other extreme, we find people who are coming up with wonderful models. I'll give you one example from a remote area in India where they introduced telemedicine. And you call in a number like 911 and all, and there are people from different specialties, and they have people who can speak different languages because so many of different are there. And when they're talking of cost, you just see the difference between night and day because some of these places, they're coming up with an average cost of less than $1 for a treatment of a patient. And we think it's totally ridiculous to quote numbers like that. So that's the difference which we see. And just as in the case of check processing, I think it will be again a case of reverse, reverse innovation where the development will first take place in other countries. They will start applying it first and U.S. will be actually a latecomer in this field. Right. And you mentioned check processing. We uh, should mention for our audience, Dr. Gupta's research, uh, he did pioneering research that uh, led to the creation of electronic check clearance, uh, addition, uh, the commercialization of voice over IP technology. Uh, he also developed uh, neural network algorithms uh, for mammograms uh, to reduce false positives and false negatives. Um, one of your themes is is healthcare interoperability. Um, for, our, for, for the lay people, what does that mean to you? Well, first I want to clarify one issue. A lot of this work has been done by people under my supervision, so let me be the first to tell that they are the ones who do the work. I just keep them out of trouble and I get them the money, what they need to do, and I give them a direction. The second thing in terms of interoperability is that we all speak different languages in the sense uh, in real life, but in hospital environments, also historically different hospitals went it for different systems, different way of holding, say, nurses' notes, for example, recording it down. Then we had companies which came in for billing. Those were the companies which came up with the electronic health record systems, primarily from a billing point of view. Then the federal government came along, wanted more things to be done. So we have had different agencies, different organizations go for, with the information from different needs. The problem it creates is that we have come to a situation where these people cannot speak each other and in the old days you go to the same doctor, same thing, it was fine, but when you have telemedicine, when you have all these different medical specialties, this information should be fully exchangeable. Right. Today there are situations where the same hospital, and I've had this myself, in fact over the last one year, we went to x-rays for one place and the other hospital we went. Even though it's part of the same chain, they could not go get that x-ray and they wanted us to go through that x-ray again. And we had to go behind the scenes. I had to call the CIO of the hospital chain and he went and got those x-rays done and transferred. But again, at the normal level for a normal patient, that wouldn't have taken place. Right. So all these things are adding cost. And to give you an example, in the world, some years ago, there were 200 different languages which were uh, in vogue. 200 different currencies which were involved. If you wanted to convert money from one currency to another currency, you had to have 200 times 199 converters. What you do in real life is to convert it first to dollars or pounds and then you convert back. So we need some ways in which you can minimize or reduce this effort which is involved. Right. But the problem which is there is that different medical specialties are going in different directions within the US. There are multiple people who are trying to take care of interoperability. Different countries are doing it. There's no synergy and this is medicine and healthcare is really a global industry and unless we think about global leadership in this area we are not we are just going to have these short-sighted kind of views and short-sighted solutions right now let's talk about your latest venture you've recently become uh, named editor-in-chief of telemedicine telehealth uh, at MIT um, talk about that well my newest role is a journal which is called telehealth and medicine today and uh, I was invited to become editor-in-chief of it. MIT is not directly involved in it, so I've accepted the responsibility. And the reason I got interested in this one is that this is one of the few journals which is not domain-specific. Right. Some journals come from medical areas, some come from computer science, some come from strategy. This is a journal which is open, 
uh, it's not uh, related to any of those uh, domains. It's authorized or supported by the uh, American Telemedicine Association. So I'm using, thinking of using this as a pedestal to cover several kinds of issues. One is to take the different uh, factors to it, like the strategic issues, the business issues, the legal issues. Right. Uh, we want to give more examples of what's happening internationally, draw attention to the kind of environment, just as I mentioned about the Thakan, there are wonderful things being done in other places around the world, which we want people to know. And conversely, we want people to know what's happening in America. So that's another mission. And the third issue I want to do is to foster a culture where industry, academia, and government actually can work together to address some of these issues, like interoperability issues, payment issues, reimbursement issues. Unless we find mechanisms like this, it's going to be very difficult. And today, if we see the per, in terms of cost, uh, the cost involved on treating a patient in the US is higher than that in any other country of the world. But when we take any of the statistics which is there, we are ranked somewhere like 60th or 70th out of 200 countries. Right. These are statistics from the CIA, they are statistics from the World Health Organization. So, and again, in some of these cases, our number on this uh, ladder is actually coming down, not going up. So we are not moving up this ladder, we are going down. Right. So those are the kind of issues that I'd like to tackle through my role as an editor-in-chief of this journal. Well, that's wonderful. I wish you every success. Thank uh, you very much. Dr. Gupta, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed it. The 2019 Converge to Accelerate conference is brought to you by IEEE, the world's largest technical professional organization for the advancement of technology. Bollinger Ingelheim, passionately working to improve healthcare. NASCO, advancing digital health together. IPSI-US, the Association of Independent Workers, for one, for all. Partners in Digital Health, publishers of the forward-reaching blockchain in healthcare today and telehealth and medicine today. Special consideration to iWorker Innovations, taking the independent workforce to new heights. Connected Health Conference, designing for healthy habits and better outcomes. Haven Health Solutions, providing true blockchain transactional interoperability. Special thanks to Seaport World Trade Center for hosting us. And a special thanks to 1-800 Public Relations for all your PR and media support. We'll be right back after these messages. Don't go away.